I know I begin every week by saying I'm excited to share this with you, but I am excited to share this with you guys. Last week we looked at God breathed and what it means. Today we're going we're to pull out and look even deeper at the same time while expanding what we look at. <clears throat> Speaking of fathers, there, hello there. Hi. <laughs> See me after church. I want to get your phone number. No. <clears throat> Sorry. But... But we're streaming this. This is my wife, by the way. Just want everyone to know. Sorry. <laughs> Got momentarily distracted there, but that's a good distraction. There was a chief in a very deep jungle in South America, and he had a son. His son's name was Andre. The chief's name was Fernando, and he was the chief of the Munane tribe. And this was deep in the dark forest of Colombia. Colombia. You must say it that way. Colombia. And inside this forest, Andre's job every day week in and week out, was to tend the rubber trees, the rubber plants, and all the medicinal plants that would be cut down and would be sold off. That was his job. And he loved it for many, many years, but it just started to get tiresome to him. And he began to question things like, why am I here? What is the meaning of life? Why am I here in this beautiful forest cutting it down? And is there, is there purpose in this? There has to be more. What, and what happens after this life? And he began to ask these questions and really wrestle with it. And one night, as he was laying in his hut, he was in his cot, a wealthy landowner nearby had given him his old transistor radio. And he would just, out of boredom, just cycle through the, just move that needle up and down the band, trying to find any kind of signal. And one night, for the first time, it crackled to life. And it was such a powerful, clear signal. He had never gotten a signal like this before. And it was from Trans World Radio. Now, if you don't know anything about that, that's a missionary radio, and it has awesome Christian, I mean, you can get it in, in, in the remotest jungles, as you see. And he was listening to it, and he said he was transfixed. And the words that came through this bizarre, out-of-nowhere, sharp, clear signal were these mysterious words. The sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. That had Andre's attention. And wouldn't you know it, by divine providence perhaps, that night the moon did not give its light. See, unknown to Andre, that was the exact night of a rare lunar eclipse that covered the Colombian jungle in pitch blackness. Hearing those words marked with this and he's seeing that man, you had his attention. So he goes to bed. The next morning, he walks out into his village, and a man shows up, completely uninvited, completely unannounced, and he is a missionary. He's with Wycliffe Bible Translators, and he walks in, and he sits down in the middle of this tribe, and he opens his Bible, and he stumbles through as best he can gospel stories, and he just simply reads God's Word over and over. And Andre said he was mesmerized. He started to look down. He said, that's it. That is the book I heard last night on the radio. He didn't even know what it was called. But he went up to Andre and he said, to the missionary, he said, that book contains truth. Yes, it does. That book contains life. Yes, yes. He says, I know, I felt it in my bones. I knew the moment you started reading it that that was the book I heard last night on the radio. Tell me more. And he says, I'm here to try to translate this into your native language. Andre said in that moment, he surrendered. And he said, I will be your life partner and co-translator as long as you need me. For the next 18 years, that's what Andre did. Bringing the living word of God to people who had never heard it before. This book had the power to change his life in an unseen, invisible airwave in the middle of the jungle. And that's how God's word is. It is living. It is a two-edged sword, sharper than anything we could buy on a Ginsu knife stand. It is the most incredible, living, breathing word of God. And sometimes I think we're so cavalier with it. We're so casual. Like, yeah, I've got 17 copies. I throw one in the back of my car after church by the Taco Bell wrappers. By the way, did you take the challenge last week? Anybody notice anything different about where you put your Bible when you were done and how you treated it? It just starts getting you thinking, wait a minute, maybe... If I stop treating this like just any book, I won't treat it as if it's every other book. And it will start to have a place in my home that is so timeless. 
And then we move to the next stage, which is application. See, last week we looked at 2 Timothy 3.16. Today we zoom out and we look at the passages leading up to that verse. Verses 10, 11, and 12. Even verse 13 and 14. Because we want to know where the context is. Where does this come from? Because context is key. Hear me. This is so important. All these deep truths, I can't wait to share. Some of these things I learned just this week in trying to put this together to share with you. Let me set the context of what we're going to read because it will make it come alive. Paul is writing to Timothy in this letter. And we're used to Paul writing letters. His epistles are awesome. We love them. We think they're fantastic. And they are. But there's something different about this one. If you read it, there's almost this bizarre finality to this letter. There's almost a note of, dare I say it, sober-mindedness that this could be it. See, what we know now on this side of history, this was the last letter Paul would ever write because he's stuck in jail. And he's encouraging us from jail. And he's in chains. And he's saying, Timothy, this is, let me just tell you the verse he said. I am being poured out like a drink offering. My time, my departure is at hand. He's, 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 he's aware. He knows something's up. He even goes on and says these famous verses. I have finished the race. I fought the good fight. And he's going to prep Timothy for what's about to happen. He is literally trying to set the ground for him being the next great pastor and preacher of the people there. But there's something, because there is a wicked, evil emperor on the throne. And his name is Nero. And this is a bad mamma jamma. This guy is not to be played with. He is not. Something's wrong with this guy. He is so despotic, so wicked. He is doing things. Paul knows his time is short. He's chained in prison. And to make matters worse, suddenly... His closest friends and his followers are pulling back from him. They're withdrawing. Some of them are turning their back flat out on Paul. And he's like, what is going on? Well, guess what's happened? Nero, the dastardly, wicked Nero, has spread rumors. And he's gone around, and he's having a problem, man. You, you think our presidents in America have troubles with the Senate? Check out what Nero had going on. Man, this guy was losing his grasp on his power, and he, was, he killed his mom. Killed his sons. He he was starting to get paranoid. And so what he does, he plots and he schemes and he goes out and he says, I'm going to go light this fire. I'm going to have my secret people go out and I'm going to light and burn down one of the most famous things in all of the city, Circus Maximus. All along, if this looks familiar, then you remember Ben-Hur and all the great chariot races and stuff. This had rows and rows of houses around it and colonnades and all kinds of shops and stuff. Almost 80% of the city was consumed by this huge fire. You ever hear the thing, uh, Nero fiddled while Rome burned? This is where they come up with that because he didn't even seem to care. And it backfired for a minute on Nero. See, Nero, people started getting mad. Guess what he did? He came up with an excuse and he blamed the Christians. And guess at this time who was the head of the Christians in the city? Paul. So this whole thing, people were so mad, they wanted a scapegoat. Does this sound familiar? They wanted to blame somebody, and they started to believe that maybe, just maybe, Paul had something to do with it, even though he's in jail. So some of his closest friends started to listen to these rumors, and they pulled back, and they said, ah, that's not what Christ is. Maybe we should, maybe, maybe Paul's not the one. And some of his closest friends pulled back on him. You want to talk about hurt? He's sitting in jail. Almost everybody had pulled away from him except one guy named Timothy. Timothy was a special guy. You all know I love racing and I'm such a, an athlete. <laughs> what is this? A baton. Ryan's got a picture here of some racers. When you're running and you've done all you can on that first kick, your job is simply to hand the baton off to the next person. Paul is that first guy. He has run the race. He has given it all, and he has never dropped the baton. And he's looking to groom this next generation, which is so important to mentor the next. And he hands it off. This is is him handing off the baton to Timothy in this book. He's saying, Timothy, I urge you to stay strong. Stay steadfast. There's going to be people coming that are going to pull you away. They're going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. They're going to be some desperate, nasty people. And some of them are not what you think they are. Some of them are going to be in your inner circle. 
and they're going to whisper things, and they're going to try to sow false doctrine, and they're going to try to pull people. They're going to even try to seduce other people away from the truth. But you know God's word. And so here's what I want you to do, Timothy. I want you to stand fast. You've watched me. You know me. You know these rumors are false. Stay in the fight. And with that as our background, read with me starting at verse 10 and see if this doesn't come alive to you with new freshness. Verse 10. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, what happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of all of them the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters your word may say seducers there, will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them. Okay, he's pointing back to himself there. And that from childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, which is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Go back to verse 12 here. I want to show something. We're going to dive really deep. I want you to look at this. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, hey, Timothy, all who believe in God are going to be persecuted. He doesn't say that for good reason. He says, all those who choose to follow Christ, to live godly in Christ Jesus, will suffer persecution. All of them. This is a huge difference, church. I want you to see this, okay? This is not just anyone. Everybody can claim to believe in God. Lots of people, even false religions say, well, sure, we believe in a higher power. All roads lead to heaven. That's all. Paul's saying, the devil, the enemy ain't going to persecute you for that. He's happy to let people go along believing in something greater. Kumbaya, we'll just hug the tree. We are the world, Mother Earth. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is preaching Christ and Christ crucified and him alone as the way, the truth, the way to the Father. So he's saying, if you live a godly life, if you stand out, if you are willing to be consecrated, to live a separate life, not pulling away from the world, but not living like the world, then count on it. Persecution will come even to the point of verbal slander, possibly physical persecution itself. That word persecution, you know what it literally means? It has the picture of a guy with a whip chasing someone down, trying to drive them away from the truth. That's persecution. What a powerful image of the enemy trying to drive people away from the truth of God's word. Now, look at verse 13. You see that a lot of translations say evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The translation in the King James says evil men and seducers. I looked into this. Y'all know what seducers means? The original Greek word for seducers here is goes. Goes carries with it the weirdest connotation. It carries with it an illusionist, like a carnival illusionist, who is trying to deceive you with one hand while doing something else with the other. Okay? Now think about that. Okay? This is not a parlor trick. This is not like we think of magic. It's not like, hey, pick a card, any card. No, I'll tell you, ace of spades. This is not that. It is far more creepy. Because the word goes comes from the root Greek word goa. You know what that means? Ooh, it literally means a dark power being muttered under your breath, as in an incantation or a spell. Now, knowing that, Paul is using that on purpose, saying there will be people so evil, they will intentionally look you in the eye and will be deceiving you almost by dark occultic practices. That's evil. Someone intentionally trying to take you and get you on the wrong path. And he's saying, Timothy, run from those people. You need to be that beacon. You need to be that preacher who stands up and says, sorry, this is what the word says. Sorry if you don't like it, but not sorry. We don't get to rewrite this. This is God's word, and you need to stand firm, and you need to to practice this. He goes on, though, in verse 14 and 15, and he has the good news, which I love this. This is the antidote to evil men. Look at verse 14. But you must continue in the things which you've learned and you've been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures and they're able to make you wise for salvation and faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, he's saying you will not be easily deceived. You will not be easily manipulated by the goes. You won't be hoodwinked because you know the truth. It is so much harder for you to be deceived by the enemy if you know this word. 
So much. If you know this, you will know if somebody, even your pastor, if he's standing up and preaching something that is untrue, your spirit and your knowledge of the word will go, what? Wait a minute. That's, that's not right. And you will be able to know it. But if you don't know this word, we can be seduced by people who have bad intentions, man. Bad things. There are people out there who will do that. In this day and age, there are some people who have I got to be careful what I say. Let's just say there are people, I don't like to mention names from the pulpit, who have seduced thousands of people and tickled their ears and told them what they want to hear. And they don't necessarily preach both sides of the gospel. And that is a dangerous thing. And Paul is saying, Timothy, don't be like that. You need to know where you stand and be able to stand on the truth and have your godly heritage hand this to the next generation. Knowledge and application of the scriptures is your defense against being seduced by imposters. What a beautiful thing. And then that brings us to the verse we looked at last week, verse 16, where we learned that Scripture is God-breathed. God breathed upon those who wrote down his words. And then it says it is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction. And you remember last week we took our road trip to the beach and we got to see what this four-stop journey looked like. But I skipped one word on purpose. And that's the very first word. It is profitable. What in the world does that mean? If I were to ask you, hey, What's profitable mean to you? Let's say I have an investment. If I were to tell you I have a, a, a 401k or a fund or some kind of Roth IRA or something that I want you to invest in because, man, the, the dividends are crazy. They're awesome. Give me your $1,000, and in six weeks, you're going to have $100,000. Would that have your attention? Here's the key. It does not make you any money if you do not invest. I can know about it all day long, but if I never, imagine me going to AT&T today and going, hey, back in 1986, I meant to invest $1,000. Can I have my million point six now in shares? And they'd be like, no, you can't. Why? Because I didn't invest in them. Therefore, I do not reap the rewards. Do you see where this is going? We cannot reap the rewards if we never study the book. I'm not talking about study just for knowledge. I'm talking allow it to apply to our life, to make life change. That's where the rubber meets the roads. Here's the key point, number one for us today. The word of God is profitable for us, but we must invest in it. That means study it and apply it in order to reap the dividends. It's not enough just to know about God's word if we don't let it affect our life. God is giving us these great guardrails for reproof and correction and instruction. I think so many times, especially the modern church is ignoring this and not allowing it to change their life. So, Here's the big question, which leads us to what I promised we would address today. How in the world do we study this and apply God's word? What is the practical way that we can actually apply God's word? I'm so glad you asked, because I have with me, hiding again, my trusty cart. Now, you all know I love application, and I love exegesis, and I try to find this great balance between the two. So what I wanted to show you was what made the difference in my own life from going from knowing about God's word to letting it change my life. So I brought with me a few of my favorite study Bibles. It is fine, hear me, to have a pocket copy of Gideon's good news. It is awesome. I probably have eight of these. There's nothing wrong with this. But if this is the only thing that I crack open, I am missing out on a lot of fruit from scholarship of giants who have gone on before me people who are genuine scholars who understand the context of why this book was written, how it was written, and the culture it was written in. So I started to look, and I wanted to share with you a few of these. I'm going to leave these up. This is some of my favorite Bibles. This is a four translation, okay? It's got the New Living. It's got the new NASB, the New King James, NIV, great stuff. There's a worship study Bible. When I was a worship leader, I wanted to see what the psalmist thought and all kinds of stuff. Man, these are thick and they have so many great things in it. And then there's the MacArthur study Bible to see John MacArthur's notes. And some of his stuff is awesome and some of it's woohoo. And then there's other ones. There's my disciple study Bible, which was so, so inspirational. I used this for probably eight years because the notes in it teaching me stuff that, man, I didn't even get in seminary. And then awesome people like Louise Dona got me this one just last week, the Jewish translation of the Holy Scriptures that brings out all kinds of awesome, deep stuff that you don't get reading our super homogenized English version that's so American sometimes, it's scary. Then 
There's a Defender Study Bible, which was awesome. This got me through my master's degree because this helped me see for the first time that maybe the whole Bible isn't just symbolic and literary and beautiful, but maybe it actually means what it says it means. And this rescued me from my extreme liberalism and got me grounded to give God a chance to first say what he says, give him a chance to mean what he means, and then if it's not physically possible to accept what it means, then you go out and you start looking for symbolic and different things. This was awesome. You can't have this, by the way. This was my Ryrie Study Bible, one of the very first ones I got right after I was saved. The bishops bought me this. Bishops, if you're watching, thank you. Because of you, I'm in the ministry. My Quiet Time Bible, woo, this was fantastic. My Living Bible that has daily devotionals in it. This was great, I loved it. But things started to take off, y'all. When I started to go and eat the fruit of some of these people who have gone on, my Jeremiah Study Bible, oh, this is awesome, y'all. Don't get this. This is, so, this is mine, and half of what I preach probably comes out of this right here, okay? So <laughs> don't be getting this, or you're going to be hearing it two or three times, okay? This is fantastic. So find you a different one. A couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago, Amy surprised me, and this is probably my new favorite thing, the Hebraic Prophetic Study Bible. Man, this is raw meat. This is like eating filet mignon at six in the morning. It is like breakfast, like you can't even, oh, it is so amazing, and I love it. But the one that stands out the most is this one. The very first one that my parents got me. They signed it right here in the beginning, and it was the day I was licensed to the ministry. Presented to Matthew Scott Mitchell from Mom and Dad, August 20th, 1989. Woo, getting old. To commemorate receiving your license into the ministry with our deepest love. You see, this is before the internet. And this had these little fancy things called thumb tabs. If you're over 40, you, you know what these are because you're nodding. But it had something else in there because you couldn't go Google it. You actually had to look. And when somebody said, hey, turn to Hezekiel Quasimai, you're like, where's that? And you got I found it. Had something else in it. Had this little thing right here. You know what that is? That's a ribbon. This was so cool because it divided God's word and it reminded you where you were studying. I remember in 1992... A goofy movie came out by the title of this, A River Runs Through It. And that's what reminds me of this. But instead of a river runs through it, it's a ribbon runs through it. See, in this, this is, I didn't see this movie, so I don't know what it is. I, I don't even know what this guy's doing. He's got like some kind of bizarre stick and some kind of line, and he's, I don't, it's called like fishing, fi fishing. It's some bizarre word, and he's, and he's doing something, but all it looks like to me is punishment because it's hot, it's humid, and there's mosquitoes. And that's not my thing, but it's apparently his, and it was directed by some no-name, Robert Redford, and some other actor who probably won't have a career, Brad Pitt. And I didn't see the movie, but I remembered the name of it. And it reminded me, a ribbon runs through it, and any good Bible study should have three ribbons running through their Bible. Not, not literal ribbons, figurative ones. The first ribbon that we need to know when we look at our Bibles is the, the ribbon that says what the Bible says. That is our very first ribbon, what the Bible says. See, right here, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, Be diligent, Timothy. Present yourself approved to God, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what these ribbons do. It gives us this beautiful, this illustration here. The first ribbon, let's call it what the Bible says, because what this marks is what the original author of the scriptures meant to the original readers. And study Bibles were awesome for that. They help you bridge this gap because not all of us are Bible scholars, nor are we called to be Bible scholars. But we can eat the fruit of their hard work and their interpretation. They can bridge the gap of thousands of years of culture that we'll never understand. That's why it's so important to take advantage of this. We have to know what the Bible meant to its original readers before we can accurately apply it further. The second ribbon, let's call it this, what the Bible means. This is so important to us. Once we know what the Bible says, we can then move to what the Bible means in its original context. The notes and the commentaries, and some of those things are great. Let God speak to you first by himself. Then if you need clarity on something or you want to find out what a word means, that's where you go and you bridge thousands of years of cultural change to know what it meant then before you can apply it today. Which brings us to the third ribbon, what the Bible means for me. I'm going to give a warning here. Too many people start there. Hear me. 
This is not where we start. To start there and say, oh, here's what the Bible means to me is such a bad thing. False religions have been built out of that. Cults have been built. False denominations have been built by looking at a verse, taking it so out of context, saying, well, this is what it means to me. That is not biblical exegesis. That's eisegesis. That's, look, that's pouring your, what you want into a verse. You do not start there. Only when we know what the Bible says in its original context, only what we know what it meant then, do we have permission to see what the Bible means for us today. Then you can apply it. Only then is it safe to do that. You hear me? So we don't start twisting Scripture and start distorting it far out of context, because context is everything. Let me show you what I mean. Have you ever read somewhere in the Bible something that seemed contradictory? Right? Or something bizarre, like some past passage about like this camel having to go through like an eye of a needle. What is that about? Or maybe some bizarre passage of these emissaries being returned with their beards shaved half off and their pants are missing. What in the world? How does that apply to us today? Context is everything. Look at this verse right here. I love this verse. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When Jesus said that, a camel was probably one of the largest things that everyone could recognize out there in the Judean desert. The eye of a needle was one of the smallest ones. Today, we know of bigger things, and we know of far smaller things down to the cellular level. We could replace them in our modern vernacular with a thousand different things and mean the exact same thing. But Jesus chose these. What he's doing is he is using contrast by way of exaggeration. And this is what he did. It is a beautiful, beautiful poetic device that he used all the time. He told stories. He told parables. And he was shocking people to have them come out of their shell and listen. The key word that you need to focus in is that third word, easier. This is where the contextual application happens. What he's saying is don't let wealth make it next to impossible to receive God's salvation. So many people were doing that. You remember the wealthy lander? What must I do to be saved? Well, do this, this, and this. Oh, I can't do that. I'm wealthy. And there were so many people coming up saying, I'll follow you. I'll surrender it all, Jesus. <laughs> you can have everything. Well, not my checkbook. <laughs> Are you crazy? And he saw so many people go away sad because they had great wealth. They were holding on to so much in this life and losing the life that mattered. So Jesus was using this incredible contrast. Here's the other one that that we hear all the time, these, these contradictions. I love this. Look at this one, Proverbs 26. Do not answer a fool according to his folly. Look at 26.5. Answer a fool according to his folly. So which one's right? You have to know the context. The context of Proverbs is wisdom versus folly. That is the entire umbrella of Proverbs. Wisdom versus folly. Don't answer a fool because you're going to be looking like a fool. Or, in the second hand, you better answer the fool and set him straight, or he's going to think he's right. Here is the contextual application that you miss if you do not study God's Word. The context of it, it takes wisdom and discernment to know when and when not to answer a fool. And that's what the writer of Proverbs is saying. Not every foolish comment deserves a reply. <laughs> Have you ever wished you could take something back? Why did I even engage in that conversation? Dear Lord, please help me retract that. But you can't. That's what Proverbs is saying. Use wisdom and discernment to know. That other strange one that I quoted, I love this. This is so wild. In 2 Samuel, we read of this king in Ammon who died, and his son ascends to the Ammonite throne. King David hears about it, and he's being a nice guy, and he sends a delegation over with probably some snacks and some goodies, and he says, I share in your grief, I'm sorry for the loss of your father. Welcome to the throne. This guy not only rejects David's nice gesture, he takes those men and he does something unthinkable. He shaves half of their beard off and then he cuts their pants off at the waist to reveal intentionally their hindquarters. And then he sends them home that way. And the Bible says in verse 5, it says they were greatly ashamed. You see, back then, it was unheard of. You never shaved your beard unless it was a time of grieving. You just didn't do it. It was your source of pride and honor, like, like long hair to a, to a woman. It was their source of, of glory. So when this guy shaved off half his beard and sent them back, missing parts of their clothes, David knew right away this was an attack on humiliation, trying to totally make these guys absolutely ashamed and humiliated. David 
let these men go live in seclusion while their beards grew and their shame passed. Gave them new clothes and says, you don't have to come back until your shame has passed. I'm so sorry he did that to you. What is the context of that? What is the application? Are we allowed to treat people like that? Are we allowed to embarrass people? And to, Never. This was a, a pagan king doing a hateful act that was not to be copied. The spiritual application in context is that the Old Testament acts have some strange behaviors, some weird stuff. You must thoroughly understand them before you even think of applying those to your Christian life today. This is an example of what not to do. Context is critical. Once you know the context, then you can study deeper. Here's the reason. Information without application is stagnation. Nobody wants to be a stagnant, stinky swamp where water comes in, but it never leaves. And it gets putrid and black, and you can't even see it. It's nasty, and who knows what's at the bottom. And it's, if you've ever been in a swamp, it's, it reeks. And that's what stagnation happens. All, if we just keep eating and gorging and never applying this to our life, that's why James specifically said this. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Quit deceiving yourself. What a beautiful verse. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're deceiving yourself. He compared it to a Bible being a mirror. As we gaze into God's word, we see ourselves, the good, the bad, the blemishes, the scars, and we know we need God's love. Jesus addressed this beautiful verse. Look at this in Matthew chapter 7. Whoever hears these words of mine and does them is like the wise man. He's the one that built his house on the rock. This is so perfect for today. But anyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't do them, what is he like? He's like a fool who built his house on the sand. Dive deep. There's some hidden gold here. Both of these men heard Jesus. Both of these men were sitting at Potter's Hand Berean Church over in Judea that day, and they were listening to Jesus talk. Both were probably nodding. Both were probably awake. But only one of them went away and applied his words. The other one nodded politely and went about his way and never thought about it again. And Jesus is saying the difference in how they lived was rock and sand. Night and day. Which one are you? Do you internalize things? Do you come out? Do you, do you apply things? Do you allow God to do it? Because it's not just enough to be students of the Bible. We have to be disciples of the Lord. Disciples of the Lord. That's it. So when the Bible says, whether in a group or on your own and you're studying, we need to consider what it says, what it means, and what it means for us. Don't just satisfy your curiosity. I never want to preach just interesting things where no one leaves changed. That is not the, the desire. It's to spur us on to holy living. So addressing the challenge I gave you last week, I asked each of us to take our love and our zeal for God's word up one notch. How'd you do? Did you see any difference this week? If you're ready for the deeper challenge, here it is. I'm going to give you a four-part challenge. Okay, if you really want to go deeper into his word, this will force you into application going from the cerebral reading of God's word to letting it change your life. Here's four questions I want you to write down to ask when you read your Bible on your own. Are you ready? Question number one, ask yourself this. After reading your passage of scripture, is there a promise I need to claim? Is there a promise here that I need to claim? Is God showing me something? Is there a, a, a prayer maybe that I need to echo? Is there something going on that is for me in this time period, not just for the culture then, is there something he is trying to show me today, right now in 2017, that I need to claim? Question number two, is there a habit I need to begin? Is there a habit I should begin with this? Perhaps a commandment that I need to put into practice that I've been neglecting, whether it's taking the Sabbath, whether it's honoring my mom or my dad, whether it's to stop coveting my neighbor's wife, is there a commandment? Is there something I need to put into practice? Is there a habit I need to begin? Maybe something good that I'm not doing. Or, question number three, is there a behavior I need to change? Maybe there's something I am doing that I need to stop doing. Is there a sin that I need to forsake? Is there an attitude I need to change? Maybe a new attitude I need to adopt. What is it? Why is God putting me in this particular passage on this day? Which leads us to the fourth, the Mac Daddy of all the questions that gets to the core of why we study. How can I be more Christ-like because of my study today? How can I be more like Christ because of what I just studied? These verses right here. 
That brings us down to it. When you ask yourself these questions, I promise you, get ready. God will show you some answers. All right? And this, this goes for teachers, by the way. If you're teaching in a small group, these four questions are awesome. Throw these out at your class. The Bible was not given to just to inform us. It was given to transform us. Huge difference. There was a professor I read about, a great inventor, and he labored away in his garage, and he would be knocking on stuff late into the night. You'd hear, and all kinds of stuff all night long for years. One day his neighbor had had enough, and he went over and he said, I got to know. I got to know what is in your garage. He says, I'll show you. Come on. And he went in. He wouldn't open the garage door. He took him in the, the side door, and he says, behold. And there in front of him was the most incredible, elaborate, ornate monstrosity of a machine that this neighbor had never seen. And he looked at it. He said it was so impressive. This contraption was, was the most enormous apparatus. He said there were gears and belts and flywheels and electronic components and flashing lights and digital readouts. And he said the guy went, he goes, watch this. And the inventor went up and he pushed the start button. And that thing was He said things started going in perfect synchronicity. It looked like a galaxy had taken shape. And it was whirring and doing all kinds of incredible stuff. He said it was so amazing. The seamless precision was hypnotic. And the neighbor just stared at it. And he just tried to, to take it all in. And finally, he looked at the inventor and he said, that's incredible. What does it do? <laughs> and the inventor says, what? I said, that's incredible, but what does it do? What, what is it good for? The inventor looked at him and said, it doesn't do anything, but look how great it works. That is a beautiful illustration of how many in today's modern society view reading scripture. It's beautiful. Look at that. Oh, it's so poetic. Oh, I love the Psalms. What does it do? If it doesn't apply, it does nothing. If you just read it and go, eh, it's meant to lead to life change. So I got to ask you, as your pastor, please let me encourage you. Are you letting it change you? Are you letting it take you deeper? Don't be like that guy. Don't be the inventor. I love the Bible. Does it change you? Not a bit. <laughs> but it's fantastic. We're deeper than that. We're supposed to be. You should crave God's word. You should revere it and honor. We don't worship the book. We worship the creator revealed in the book. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for the privilege of holding a copy of your word in our hands. Lord, forgive me for the times when I've ever been haphazard. Thank you for reminding me of the sacredness and the seriousness that you give us every time we crack open your word. Holy Spirit, thank you for never failing to speak to us, to illuminate the scriptures. You are so good. Lord, we ask that you would take us deeper. No matter how long we've been a believer, you have new truth to show us. Your word always expands. Even the great apostle Paul and Peter still had new truth that they were gathering as they studied your word and as they dug deeper. And I thank you for that. Lord, would you speak to us now during this time of commitment? You are welcome in this place. Thank you for your presence. We declare our love and our dependence on you in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.